Good evening. We are so glad that you are joining us on this first Wednesday in 2023. Uh, so good to be back together again on Wednesday night. Uh, we were driving in just before dinner, and um, the whole day had been cloudy, and then all of a sudden the sun shone, and uh, it was beautiful to see God's creation on display. And um, so, again, we are glad that you're here joining us in person or online. Um, this is a, a, um, a great opportunity for us, for the, for the people of God, to gather together, hear from God's Word. I um, want to let you know that uh, Jeff Randolph, who is our new uh, associate pastor for students, uh, he's up with our students tonight for the very first time. And uh, so I want to say thank you to the church for praying uh, for that whole process. Uh, God had his hand on um, who needed to be here and how it's all worked out, and so we're excited about that. Um, and uh, we can uh, celebrate um, that we uh, surpassed our Lottie Moon goal for this year. That's right. Um, it's unofficially right now, because we don't know exactly if there's anything else that will come in um, in the next few days, but $118,000 were raised, was raised for international missions. That's right. Um, and I just, I'm amazed to see, uh, maybe I'm amazed that I'm amazed, <laughs> isn't it, um, that we sometimes um, put limitations on what God can do, and uh it's amazing to see how God is working through the people here at Mount Vernon in our community. We had wonderful Christmas Eve services, Christmas Day services. Um, and so all of you who were a part of that, wh whether you were serving or whether you had uh, friends and family come, um, and many of you uh, spent time with your friends and family, I just, it's such an incredible time to see the family of God get together, open God's word, and celebrate who he is and what he's done. And so I just want to say thank you. Um, what a great time we had. Well, let's uh, jump into God's word. So let me pray for us, and then we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we are in awe again and again because you reveal yourself in a very real way through your word. Lord, we thank you for your word that uh, lets us see you. Uh, that um, it is the truth, and we hold on to that. And Lord, uh, may we not turn away from it, may we not put it in second place, but may that be the very focal point. That's how we know who you are. You are our first love, and you have given us your word so that we know who you are. Lord, we ask that tonight, as we begin this new year, that you would impress upon us the need for you. Um, and impress upon us the disciplines that, that you are instilling in us to be more like you. For God, it's in your name I pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good evening. It's great to see everybody here tonight. And let me just add my echo, my amen to what Pastor Clayton said. Just great job, uh, church family, when it comes to our Lottie Moon goal and uh, just blowing that goal right out of the water and and uh, really i mean it we we just are uh, we just praise the lord that we're able to 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 give uh, to his work uh, something very exciting uh, that we have been asked that uh, uh, i've been asked and pastor john is uh, going to be uh, joining as well is next wednesday uh, we'll be doing chapel for the IMB uh, next uh, Wednesday afternoon, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, well, it'll be a wonderful uh, time for us to be able to just encourage them and strengthen them and pray for them and let them know that a local church in the area is fully behind and fully supportive of what they're doing for the Lord. Uh, they are on the front lines uh, serving God's kingdom expanding his work and his message in the world. So thank you so much, church family, for all of the efforts that you have uh, put forward to make that happen. If you've got your Bible, to uh, open it up, if you will, to Genesis 29. If you're not familiar with uh, what we do on Wednesday nights, we uh, take a passage from 
God's Word and we just walk our way through it. We have handouts on Wednesday night as well that you can grab on your way in at the little circle tables. And that just allows you to, to keep pace with uh, some of the things that I'll be sharing. But uh, this topic is trusting God in the disappointments. And we know the story of Jacob. Uh, Jacob is a trickster. He has uh, tricked his way all the way uh, so far, and now he is seeing it return on him. Uh, for instance, he thought he was working for Rachel, and then uh, Laban, the father of Rachel and Leah, instead tricks Jacob into marrying Leah. Remember in the Hebrew? But lo, in the morning, Leah. <laughs> uh, it was a surprise to him. What? I, I, I've married Leah, not Rachel and Laban says oh this was I, I no one told you this uh, you know this is what our custom is and of course uh, he had tricked him but you know that's uh, that's just it coming back to him uh, like we've put at the top of your handout in Galatians 6 7 that a man reaps what he sows a, a person reaps what they sow this is a New Testament idea that God is not mocked is what that Galatians 6 passage says right before this. God's not mocked. If we continue to sow to the flesh, we'll reap corruption. Uh, but if we sow to the Spirit, uh, we'll, we'll reap uh, righteousness. And, and so you've got here a, another verse of Scripture in the Old Testament is Numbers 32, 23. Be sure your sin will find you out. What does that mean? That means that God knows everything. And he observes and he is a just God. You know, sometimes we think that we're getting away with something, but uh, God is all-knowing. He sees it all. You're not hiding it from him. Remember that uh, terrible account of David, the man after God's own heart. And he sins with Bathsheba and uh, murders or aids the, the murder of Uriah. And then he thinks he's gotten away with it. Bathsheba has the baby uh, that he fathered, and he thinks he's gotten away with it. Uh, most scholars think that the, that the whole time that David was, was living in that sinful time of, of distancing himself from what God wanted was probably about a year. And the whole time he thinks he's hiding from God. He thinks he's hiding from everybody else. But God has a man a prophet, Nathan, who comes and talks to David in a way that David, he understands the story. Uh, Nathan doesn't come through the front door and say, David, this is what you did. Instead, he comes around the back door, tells him a nice little story that angers David. And David says, this is wrong. This person should never have done this. And then Nathan says, you are that man. You are that man. Now, Nathan didn't know that, but God knew. And God told, uh, God told Nathan to confront David. Well, uh, you, be sure, your sin will find you out. Uh, we reap what we sow. You know, if you're going to reap uh, apple seeds, you're not going to get oranges. And yet, that's what we want. We want to sow the life that we want to sow, and then we want to reap something different. And then we look around and we say, why am I being treated this way? And here's the question. When we feel like we're somehow getting, you know, cheated in some way, can God still work? Yes, yes, yes. You say, well, what if I have planted those apple seeds? I mean, and I, and I can see the, the oranges cropping up. Uh, is there still any hope for me? I mean, I feel that I'm getting my just desserts. I feel like I'm I'm reaping what I have sown in my life, can God still work in that situation? Yes, 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 He can. There was a, a pretty famous song called Cats in the Cradle. I almost don't want to share with you some of these lyrics. Some of you know this song. Uh, it is by uh, Harry Chapin, and it tells the story of a father who's too busy for his son. Um, the son is constantly asking the father for time, and the father continues to put him off. And listen to some of the lyrics. One verse goes like this. My son turned 10 just the other day. Said, thanks for the ball. Now, come, come on, let's play. 
Will you teach me to throw? I said, not today. I've got a lot to do. And he said, that's okay. And he walked away and he smiled and he said, you know, I'm going to be just like you, Dad. I'm going to be just like you. And the song continues where the son grows up, becomes a man. And now you've got an elderly father who's trying to find time for his son. Son, can you give me some time? And of course, you know the end of the song. The son is putting the father off, saying he doesn't have time. He doesn't have time. And he realizes, this father realizes, that the son really just has become just like he was. It's a tough thing when we reap what we sow. But yet God can still redeem it. God can still move in a difficult, disappointing situation. So Jacob is a trickster. He is. He's tricked several people that are close to him. And now he's gotten tricked in the process. And yet God is right there in the middle of it. And he's overseeing these things. So you have uh, Genesis 29 where uh, we pick up toward the end in verse 31. Let me read it for you. It says, When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, and Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has, he has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. And she conceived again and bore a son and, and said, Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Then she stopped bearing. I put in your handout the sons in the family. And uh, we can go through m much of this uh, next section, but I'll give you the short end of it. Um, these two women, Rachel and Leah, they are trying to vie for the attention of Jacob. Uh, I was thinking about, you know, the issue of polygamy, having more than one spouse. And, you know, the Bible is here. You know, you say, well, God opened Leah's womb and, and closed Rachel's womb. It doesn't mean that he endorsed polygamy. It does not mean that the Bible endorses polygamy. The Bible does not endorse that. I'll give you a couple of verses that you can write down if, you'd, uh, if you care to look that up later. For instance, Genesis 2, 24, we've already studied it. A man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He's not describing multiple spouses, just one. Uh, that's repeated three other times in the Bible. Uh, for instance, uh, you, you have uh, 1 Timothy 3, 2, and 1 Timothy 3, 12, and Titus 1, 6, where the qualifications of church leaders are that they would be the husbands of one wife or one woman kind of men. That's what it means. It's, and, you know, that's a clear statement. One woman kind of man. And, of course, that uh, involves not just, you know, avoiding polygamous relationships with multiple wives, but it is also, you know, involving any kind of immorality outside adultery or other kinds of relationships outside of that one man one woman for life marriage which is God's plan and God's purpose and God's ideal but I'll tell you the verse that I hold on to whenever somebody says what's a verse that says that a man can't have more than one wife I'll tell you the verse of scripture it's Matthew 6 24 no man can serve two masters anyway <laughs> so so the Bible is not endorsing the Bible. That's the only verse y'all are going to remember, I know. <laughs> the, the Bible is not endorsing polygamy when it's writing about it. It's telling you that there, this is a fallen world. Uh, these are, th this is a, based on the trickery of Laban that now he has, you know, now uh, Jacob has two wives instead of one. This is based on the trickery of a person, and yet God is going to move in the midst of it. He's going to work in the middle of it, and that's what you find here. Well, because Leah was unloved, she wasn't Jacob's pick, and she was in on the trickery to begin with. She submitted to that trickery of her father as well. 
and yet Jacob never loved her, not the same way. I mean, he just didn't. It says that she was unloved. And because God saw that, there's a place of pity, of mercy, of grace that God shows Leah. And, she, and God opens the womb of Leah. Four times she has sons, and yet each of these times you get the feeling that she is thinking with naming each of these sons a certain word, a certain name, that it's, it's, it's as if she's saying, now my husband will love me. Now, now we'll be close. And yet each one of those times, she's still unloved. Until finally the fourth son where she just says, I'm going to name him Judah, which means praise, and I'm just going to praise the Lord. It's as if she has just thrown up her hands and said, thank you, God, for these gifts. I think it's fascinating. You know, Rachel was the one that Jacob loved from the very beginning. From the very beginning, that wonderful love story that uh, we read about uh, in the previous lessons. And yet... And yet God shows mercy to Leah. How? Through these children. Look at this uh, note that I put on your handout there. It's in verse uh, 34 and 34. It's, it's at the bottom of your handout. If Leah could have seen down the generations, she, she would have been astonished at how blessed she was because her last two sons, Levi and Judah, would respectively father the priestly and kingly tribes of Israel. You think about it, Moses and Aaron and David and even Jesus Christ himself came from one of her boys, not Rachel. But you see, Rachel is jealous, is envious. She's trying, she doesn't know what to do. And so uh, let's pick it up in verse 1. Now when Rachel, uh, verse th of chapter 30, Now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? So she said, Here is my maid Bilhah. Go into her, and she will, she will bear a child on my knees, and I also may have children by her. And then she gave him Bilhah, her maid, as wife, and Jacob went into her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged my case, and he has heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. And Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, With great wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. So she, named, so, so she called his name Naphtali. And when Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob as a wife. And Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son. And, and uh, then Leah said, a troop comes. So she called his name Gad. And, and Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, I am happy for the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher. Now, yeah, and pause right there. Who still doesn't have a son? Rachel, I put a chart there on your handout. You can see these four women uh, who Jacob has had sons by, and I've given you the meaning of their names. So Reuben, his name means see a son. Simeon means heard. Again, uh, God has heard her prayer. Levi, attached. Perhaps my husband will be attached to me now. And even Judah prays. Dan, judge. Naphtali, my wrestling. Gad, trooper, fortune. Asher, happy. Issachar, wages. Zebulun, dwelling. Joseph, may he add, or Lord, give me another one. And then later on in chapter 35, they'll, uh, Rachel will bear Benjamin and uh, will be named son of the right hand. There's also a daughter there, and I put uh, her name there in verse 21 of chapter 30, which means judgment or vindication, and we're going to see that in just a minute. But the sons, of, uh, the, the sons in the family, these become what are the, what, what's the beginning of the tribes of Israel. Jacob's name will be changed to Israel soon in the story. And uh, then, so you'll have these sons of Israel, Jacob or sons of Israel and this is how the family becomes a nation little by little they begin to build uh, each of these out but it starts with envy with jealousy 
uh, with uh, competition. You know, one commentator referred to what you see here as it's almost like a poker game. You know, um, these two women trying to vie for the affection of Jacob. And one of them says, well, I'll give you four sons. Uh, you know, and, and then the other says, well, I'll give my maid. And then the other says, well, I'll give a maid and the four sons. And, then, and they're just back and forth jockeying with each other for this competition of this love uh, from, from their husband. And, and yet, God is still moving. We're going to see the application of it in just, in just a little bit. But look on the back of your handout there, the, stu- the superstition in the family. Let's pick it up in verse 14. He says, Now Reuben, that's the firstborn, went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, Is it a small matter that you've taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? Time out. So in that day and time, I put it, I put it in your handout there, but the mandrakes were known to be an aphrodisiac. Uh, some, th- that's why I call it the superstition. There was some superstition involved where perhaps this would help her get pregnant, Rachel. And uh, she sees the mandrakes that are discovered by Reuben, and she says, give me some of that. That, that will help me. And Leah says, is it not enough that you took my husband as well? What does that tell you? That indicates that Rachel is still in the superior position amongst the four women. That she is still the one who is calling the shots. That if she doesn't want Leah around, Leah is not around. And so Leah is saying, you took my husband from me as well. Well, Rachel couldn't take her husband if he wasn't uh, receptive to that as well. So, again, Jacob loved Rachel. Rachel is the one that, she, that, that, he, loved, that he loved. And uh, Leah sees this and seizes the opportunity. Perhaps I can lie with my husband again. So that's, why, that's where they begin to jockey for this again. So, Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, therefore, he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. This sounds foolish to us because we don't understand mandrakes. But if uh, we did, then we would see Rachel is desperate. She is desperate for a child, for a son. And she's saying, you can sleep with him tonight, but give me the, the help so that I can perhaps bear a son or bear a child that's how desperate rachel is and of course leah takes takes her up on the offer look at verse 16 jacob came out of the field in the evening leah went out to meet him and said you must come in to me for i have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes and he lay with her that night and god listened to leah and she conceived and bore jacob a fifth son leah said god has given me my wages Because I have given my maid to my husband. Again, this is a terrible, terrible family situation. I mean, this is so dysfunctional. So So she called his name Issachar. Then Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. And afterwards she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Why is that name Dinah important? It's as if Leah seems triumphant. The word Dinah means judgment or vindication. It's as if she's saying, finally, I've, I've won. Again, a sign of the dysfunction in the family. Verse 22, then God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb and she conceived and bore a son and said, God, Take away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. A couple of things I want to highlight in this passage. First of all, you see three other children that are born to Leah or to Leah's maid um, after the episode of swapping mandrakes for an evening with my husband. That's right. Why is that significant? Because the superstition was there. 
That's why the trade was made. Uh, Rachel is desperate, and yet God does not work with the superstition. Um, Here, three more children are born, not to Rachel, who had all these mandrakes that should have helped her, but you have to remember, each of these children are born. At least two years have gone by, perhaps three years have gone by, uh, since the mandrakes were given. Rachel still has no children, but Leah does. Why? Because it's not in the mandrakes. God opens the womb of Leah. God closes the womb of Rachel in this situation. So God is overseeing everything. God is working in the midst of the dysfunction. You know, Leah is unloved, and yet God blesses her specifically. And yet now, God opens the womb of Rachel. He remembers her. Not the mandrakes. The mandrakes are gone. They're over with. God remembers Rachel. It's been a couple years now. He remembers her. Why is the timetable like it is? Who knows? God is in control of the timeline. All we know is that God was working in the midst of it to show his love and his grace and his mercy on Leah, to show his love and grace and mercy on Rachel and on Jacob. But isn't it interesting that Jacob, uh, that that, uh, Rachel has Joseph, the one son, and what does she name him? She names him, may he add, as if to say, may God give me another one. There's not a, a sense of contentment here. There's no way that she's going to catch up to Leah, but maybe I could have another one. Not content with the one. And of course, it'd be many years later that that would occur. I think it's interesting. I put it in in your handout here, the second paragraph under the superstition of the family. It's impossible to avoid noticing what seems to be a declension in Leah's spiritual life from the time of the birth of her fifth son, In connection with the first four, the Lord's hand was very definitely perceived, but now there's no longer any reference to the covenant name Jehovah, and the expressions indicate what is almost only purely personal, even selfish, as two sons and a daughter are born to her. You know, she she names them um, uh, happy, or wages, or dwelling, and of course with Dinah, triumphant, or judgment, vindication. I have been vindicated. So there seems to be a decline in, in, in uh, Leah's depending upon the Lord. Well, the tricks are not over. The tricks are not over. Uh, you also have the strategy of the father. Look at verse 25. And so it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go to my own place and to my own country. Give me my wives, my children, for whom I have served you, and let me go. For you know my service which I have done for you. And Laban said to him, Please stay, for if, if I have found favor in your eyes. For I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Isn't that interesting? Here is a man that he says, I recognize God's hand of blessing on my life because you're here would that that would be said about us in our neighborhoods at our workplaces where God's people would be looked upon as such a blessing to the office such a blessing to that uh, area of employment or such a blessing to the neighborhood please don't leave I know God's hand of blessing is on my life because you're here I thought that was beautiful. Let's keep going. Then he said, verse 28, name your wages and I'll give it. So Jacob said to him, you know how I've served you and how your livestock has been with me for what you have, what you had before I came was little and it has increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming. And now when I, uh, when shall I also provide for my own house? He's saying, I don't have anything. And he said, well, what shall I give you? Jacob said, 
you shall not give me anything. If you'll just do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep your flocks. Let me pass through all of your flock today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep and all the brown ones among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and these shall be my wages. So my righteousness will answer for me in the time to come when the, when the subject of my wages comes before you. Everyone... Uh, everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. Again, if he just said, well, how about we just split up the, the flock? Or how about you give me these flock? Or the, what if those die and these live? Well, I'm sorry, Laban, yours died, but mine are alive. He could easily trick Laban. So he comes to a solution. He says, let's just say if it's spotted or speckled, which is not normal, very rare are they spotted and speckled. They're normally uh, one color or another. He says, well, if, if, it's, if it's a spotted and speckled one, that's the one I'll take, which is very rare. Notice what happens here. Laban said, oh, that it were according to your word. So he removed that day the male goats that were speckled and spotted, all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had some white in it, and all the brown ones among the lambs, and gave them into the hand of his sons. Then he put three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. You know, um, it's interesting. There, there are two different approaches to this uh, verse. Many commentators look at this as an action from Laban. That Laban takes out of his own flock, after he makes an agreement with Jacob, he takes out of his own flock all of the speckled and spotted and sends them to his sons that are three days journey away. If that were the case, if that's what's going on, Laban is tricking him again. It's as if Jacob now has to start from zero. And so uh, I put in here, Laban removes the very animals that would likely fall to Jacob and puts a three days journey between Jacob and his sons. However, though I haven't read it anywhere in a commentary, when I'm reading this passage, I'm thinking, well, maybe that's Jacob who is sending it to his sons and putting a three days journey. If that's the case, then what you have is he still doesn't trust Laban. He's wanting to separate completely his flock from the other. I still think I lean toward Laban separating the, the, the ones that he has told Jacob could belong to you, and he separates them before he takes over the flock again. Because again, this is, uh, what, uh, this is what Laban has agreed to with Jacob, is to just take the speckled and spotted. If there's one there, then you can remove it. But before that occurs... He takes all of them and lets them start from scratch. Regardless, God is still going to intervene. Um, so what do we have here? Let, let's keep going. In verse 37, and we'll finish out the chapter. Now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and of the almond and chestnut trees, peeled white strips in them and exposed the white which was in the rods and the rods which he had peeled. He set before the flocks in the gutters and in the water troughs where the flocks came to drink so that they should conceive when they came to drink. So the flocks conceived before the rods and the flocks before, brought forth streaks speckled and spotted. And then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the streak and all the brown ones in the flock of Laban. He put his own flocks by themselves and did not put them with Laban's flock. And, in the, and it came to pass whenever the stronger livestock conceived that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters and that they might conceive among the rods. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, female and male servants and camels and donkeys. What do you have here? You either have something superstitious again, or you have something that is covering what's actually happening. In, uh, you know, when it comes to, let, let me read to you what, um, what one writer from a Jewish encyclopedia stated. The commentator Nahum Sarna 
he says this, that the more vigorous of the flock, in contrast to the feebler, were single-colored hybrids. That hybrids are characterized by what is called heterosis, or hybrid vigor. Therefore, by careful observation as to which animals are more energetic, the breeder can determine which single-colored animals carry recessive genes or for spottedness. Sarna goes on, uh, goes so far as to suggest that Jacob may have gone through the elaborate procedure of arranging the peeled sticks to disguise his empirical technique. This thing that we know for sure. Lift up your heads for a second. This is what we know for sure. Jacob is trying to trick Laban. Laban has tricked Jacob. Now Jacob is trying to get one over on Laban. And here's the point of the whole thing, that God prospers Jacob in the midst of this sorry trick. What's the point? That God sees everything. He knows what's going on. And even if Jacob has concocted this superstitious notion like the mandrakes were earlier, let's con concoct, if maybe he thinks it's going to help, or maybe he doesn't and he's just trying to uh, cloak what he really knows about the flock. That if I allow these to conceive, these will be stronger. If I allow those to conceive, they'll be feebler. And if anybody ever wonders what's going on, I'll just talk about the, the streaks and the spots that are in the water. Regardless, he is tricking Laban, and it works. So you say, well, God's in the, God was endorsing this trick. No, he's not. It's really a sad success story. Much the same way when, uh, whenever Abraham would go down to Egypt, and uh, Abraham would say to Sarah, tell him you're my sister. It was a half-truth. And then later on, Isaac would do the same thing. Tell him, you're my sister, which was a total fabrication. And yet God blessed them in the midst of the trick. Here you have this God blessing in the midst of the trick as well. So, however, it does uh, remind you that not only did Jacob reap what he sowed, listen, Laban reaped what he sowed. Laban has been tricking Jacob for 20 years just to continue to have God's blessing. Don't go anywhere. Name your wages. And then I'm going to take those wages and hide them from you a three days journey. But name your wages. I'm here for you, buddy. But he's tricking him the whole time. And yet he's reaping what he sowed. I put this verse in here. Uh, let me read this first. Yes, Jacob becomes successful, but the method is still deception and sad to read. Jacob has been mistreated by Laban for 20 years, but he should trust God to make things right, not lean on his own uh, deception. He's trying to outwit Laban with his own tricks. Here are the verses. Jo Job 5, verse 13. He catches the wise in their own craftiness, and the schemes of the wily are brought to a quick end. The wicked man makes a pit, digging it out, falls into the hole that he has made. Psalm 7, verse 14 and 15. It's never right to do wrong. And yet in this instance, God is allowing it as if to say, Laban, you are also getting what you deserve. You're also reaping what you have sown. So let's go through some applications and uh, hopefully these will be a blessing to you. Number one, even in the turbulence of this blended family, you can see God is still working. Sometimes, I mean, every family's got something. Everybody's got something. Well, you know, this is a fallen world. We all have strained relationships. Some things that we regret, some comments that we regret saying, some decisions that we regret making, uh, some relationships we tore apart. And yet now, what do you do? It's like, putting the toothpaste back in the tube. You can't do it. So what it, what's going to happen? Am I just destined to live under this incredible guilt for bad decisions that I made? Or can God still move? Yes, he can still move. It may, you may not know what it's going to look like, but yet God can still work. God sees how 
preferential Jacob is to Rebekah, how scorn Leah is, he shows his blessing to Leah. Leah acknowledges God's working through the names given to each of the sons. God can still work through difficult family dynamics. Never give up on that. Number two, God's discipline may be sent to prune us. Some of these, some of the things that Jacob is going through, you pity. You pity Jacob. Uh, You pity Leah. And yet you don't know all that God is doing. But this is what we do know. God prunes us to bear more fruit. John 15, 1 through 7, it describes that. He prunes us. There are things that God wants to get out of our life. Uh, You know, we talk about people sometimes being sandpaper to us. Rubbing off the rough edges in our own character or in our own personalities. After we encounter such sandpaper relationships, we may not say this out loud, but we should at least admit it to ourselves. God, I wouldn't wish that personality on anybody, but I can say that you've used that to help shape me. I can say that you've You've knocked off a few rough edges in my life and in my personality and in my and you've made me stronger in part through that rough character, through that person who I I don't want to go through that again. Yet I'm stronger as a result. Well, uh, John 15, 1 through 7 tells us that Jesus wants his disciples to be fruitful. Pruning helps us to grow if we let it. In the moment, we may want something good, but God has something better in store. He may be preparing us for what he has prepared for us. Jacob's going to be Israel soon. Is he prepared for that? You know, um, we may look at this chapter and expect more from Jacob. Jacob... You've been to Bethel. You ought to know better. Come on. Trust God. He'll be your vindication. He'll fight your battles. You don't have to trick and and connive and deceive anymore. But you don't know what you would do in that situation. And uh, God is going to work on him still. Number three, our disappointments may become God's appointments. One fascinating detail about this chapter is Though Jacob loved Rachel intensely, the Messiah would come through Leah. The Levites would come through Leah. Leah came into Jacob's life through Laban's deception, but God turned that disappointment into his appointment. Trust God in the disappointments. Isn't that fascinating? That the Messiah didn't come through Rachel. If Jacob were asked the question, who do you want the Messiah to come through? He'd say, well, that's an easy question question i mean it's rachel all day every day and yet god says it's going to be through leah but leah says i'm disappointed and yet god allows the levites to come through her side our disappointments may become god's appointments you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow Uh, you don't know how god's going to redeem that difficult family dynamic that you're in the middle of right now. And you say, I don't know how to make sense of this. It's so complex now, and it's such a challenge, and yet you see these moments of grace in your own life. And that's God. Recognize it as God. Say the word praise every now and then. Judah. Recognize this is God's hand at work. No, it's not what I had in mind. But yet at the same time, I can see God's hand in it. So what do you do with your disappointments? Do you just give up? Or do you recognize God is still in control? I was reading this past week, uh, a man by the name of Brother Andrew, he wrote this book called God's Smuggler. And he was talking about uh, working, you know, trying to get Bibles through the Iron Curtain uh, before the fall of communism in the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe. And he was traveling across the border into uh, Romania. He was behind six other cars, and each one was taken apart by the patrols. Some cars 
uh, there were, they spent more than an hour searching and trying to find out what was in uh, what was being hidden and trying to be smuggled across the border. Hubcaps were removed. The engine was partially disassembled. Everything unpacked in the search for the smallest bit of illegal literature into communist areas. And when he saw how thoroughly those cars were being checked at the border, uh, he decided on an unusual strategy. He could have hidden the Bibles and no one would have faulted him for it. But he said, God... He said, you know, um, I either trust you or I don't. And so for him, instead of tricking the police or the, po- the border patrol, he put a few of the Bibles out, which was illegal. He couldn't get those Bibles through the border. That's what, that's what they're there for, to confiscate that kind of literature. And he said, I'm going to put some out in the open. I'll put the rest of it away, but I'll put some out in the open. He's six cars back. He notices some of them take an hour of searching. Some of them take less, but each one of them are being searched. His little Volkswagen uh, gets up, and he's the next one. He's getting ready to get out of the car, and the Border Patrol, and he just says, God, I trust you. He gets up there. The Border Patrol has his knee against the door of the car because Brother Andrew thinks, He's going to search me. He's going to search my car. I'm going to be found out. They're going to confiscate these Bibles that I'm desperately trying to get to these people in this closed country. And the officer, the Border Patrol person, he looks and makes sure that this is the right name with the right picture. And then he says, in 30 seconds, he says, move along. And Brother Andrew thinks he's misheard. He begins to creep past this border patrol agent and he creeps along and then he looks in the rear view mirror and they've got the next guy behind him out of the car they're stripping everything they're uncovering everything and he just drove past and he said thank you God I didn't have to hide it I didn't have to trick them Jacob did not have to trick Laban for him to be blessed by God We will never know that story. We only see how God used all of these events to help prepare Jacob to ultimately become Israel and to ultimately uh, be used to father this nation, this budding nation. But what is the message for us? That God can turn our disappointments into something that he can use for his glory he can you see it here god's using dysfunctional marriage dysfunctional marriages dysfunctional family dynamics and yet god is going to see them through it and bless in spite of it and give jacob success even in the midst of his trickery my mom used to sing this song um i won't sing it for you or else i'll just i'll just start crying immediately so i'm not going to do that for you but it's god will make this trial a blessing uh the lyrics are by terry tidwell popularized by another group but just listen to one of the verses now i'm standing on a mountain looking back i can see when i was in that lowest valley his strong hand was leading me oh it's good to see the sunshine and to taste sweet victory god has made this trial a blessing Oh, the grace he gives to me. God will make this trial a blessing, though it sends me to my knees. Though my tears flow like a river, yet in him there's sweet relief. There's no need to get discouraged. There's no need to talk defeat. God will make this trial a blessing, and the whole wide world will see. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I I do thank you that we can trust you uh, with our successes and we can also trust you in the challenges lord there may be somebody watching right now there may be somebody here who is going through a a dysfunctional relationship a challenging situation perhaps that they caused and lord i i pray right now that we would reach out to you and trust you in those disappointments, in those challenges, in those trials. 
Lord, I thank you that you know how flawed we are. You know how fallen our world is. You know the challenges that we face. And yet your grace and your mercy is there for us every time. Father, I pray for that individual who they're thinking about their dysfunctional relationship or challenging situation. Perhaps they're reaping some of what they have sown. Perhaps they're not. Perhaps it's just a difficult challenge. They're looking at that, but Lord, you want them to look to you. Help them realize that their greatest need is a relationship with you. Help them realize that if they don't have their life right with you, if they've not called out to you and said, Jesus, be my Lord, that's their greatest need right now. And that you can help us pick up the pieces, make something beautiful out of it. You can make this trial a blessing. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed. God bless you, and we'll see you on Sunday.